Okay. Welcome everybody uh, to this update on OER activities at Call CBUA member institutions. Um, just a reminder that we are recording this, uh, so if you don't feel comfortable with recording, please uh, contact me and we will um, I'll figure out a way to uh, address any concerns that you might have. Um, first, before we uh, begin, I just want to, um, once again, I want to thank first Daniel for putting this all together for us. He, uh, if any, if, I'm not sure if everybody has met Daniel Kokrock, but he is in the middle of your screen potentially, and he is also our uh, Atlantic OER project manager, and we'll be hearing from Daniel a little later in the session. But before we get started, I just uh, wanted to acknowledge that CALL CBUA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, and in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunatsiwut and Nunukavut, uh, the Innu of Natasinan, the Bealtic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulustiwuk, uh, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, we are a four province uh, organization, so we always make sure to include our, our acknowledgement of all four provincial territories uh, and indigenous peoples who share their lands with us in those four provinces. Um, today, we have a full slate of speakers. Um, we have, uh, let me see, nine speakers now uh, who will be presenting uh, or at least giving us a little bit of an update on what they're doing uh, or what's going on in terms of, uh, of OER in their institutions. Um, we are doing this in reverse alphabetical order by the institution. Um, names. So uh, we, uh, just an FYI, uh, we do have, um, because we have nine speakers and limited time, uh, each speaker will have around five minutes um, to do, uh, share with us. And then at the end of all the speakers, if I could ask that you hold your comments till the end, that would be greatly appreciated so that we can make sure that all of our speakers get a chance to speak before we start asking uh, questions about the different activities that they're going to be presenting on. Um, after our member institutions uh, give their updates, uh, Daniel's also going to give an update on Atlantic OER itself and what we've been doing there. Um, so uh, without further ado, and I forgot to introduce myself, uh, apologies, I think most people know me, but just in case there's some new folks that I, there's some names actually I hadn't seen before. So uh, I'm Cynthia Holt, the Executive Director for CALL CBUA. Um, so we will get ourselves started uh, with University of Prince Edward Island, we have Kim Mears, who is our Health Sciences and Scholarly Communications Librarian there. Kim. Hi, everybody. Uh, so a quick update about what's going on at UPEI. We have a Young Canada Works funded uh, position for an OER associate, and they have been working over the summer and helping out with various OER projects going on campus. A couple examples are a geospatial humanities OER that was a great recipient of one of our grants and she's been helping with imports and content. They have been working in a Word document and so she's helping them get it into Pressbooks. She's also been helping in engineering uh, OER and um, that takes the form of flashcards. So they're working on um, some open sourced flashcard content as well as an OER. And she was learning um, our OER associate also assisted with that project and she has helped with um, the textbook in uh, writing in um, latex or latex is uh, I've seen it pronounced both ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she has used a, a press books plug in that we have installed to write equations and help um, make those accessible in that textbook. Um, another example is that she did an accessibility audit of an existing OER that a faculty member had published. So in doing that, she went back and added um, uh, alt text to images, um, alt 
text to links, um, all of those kind of things that make an OER accessible. She's been assisting with all of those items. And lastly, we have received additional funds from the province as a result of our student union advocating for funds. Um, I won't say the exact number yet because it hasn't officially been announced um, from the university. We're still waiting on the, the final word, but there will be some more funds coming to offer our grants again, and it may be um, multi-year. So there may be enough funds for two years instead of just one year. So that's what's going on at, at UPI. And I will put a link to our Pressbook, Pressbooks um, website so you can visit it and you can look at some of our um, books that are available in our catalog, um, which are more than just OERs. We also have our um, publication from our art students. So it's the arts review. We also have that in there. So that's what's going on at UPEI. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot and we may be reaching out to you because your intern sounds like she's doing a lot of the things that we would like to do. So thank you. Um, next up we have from the, oh, wait a second, I'm just making sure we uh, have Mike here. I didn't actually check that. Uh, you do. Okay, okay. Just make sure Mike, I didn't see your, <laughs> um, so our, there we go. So uh, our next speaker is uh, from the University of New Brunswick. It's Mike Nason, who is a scholarly communications and publishing librarian. Take it away, Mike. Uh, yeah, I don't have a ton to update. I think um, uh, we've had a few people who have reached out to me about creating books in the Atlantic OER platform, which is really nice. Uh, most recently, we had someone from our education faculty contact me. And actually, I think the both contacts have been very invested in both in the education faculty, which rules. Um, and then the other thing that's been happening is sort of a consistent um, communication with other liaison librarians or people I work with saying, I was just talking to ex faculty and there are people in that faculty who are already using open textbooks, which is great. Uh, they very rarely tell us and they don't have to self report. Uh, so I generally don't know who or what is doing them. Um, uh, but yeah, just sort of this like word of mouth stuff. And then the other piece has been, uh, I've been very fortunate to have a sort of consistent uh, working relationship with the student union, both in UMB Fredericton and UMBSJ, and in particular UMBSJ, who were working pretty closely with the New Brunswick Student Alliance um, to try to work a little bit more closely with universities and uh, in terms of advocacy. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to end up at the end of last term in front of our UMBSJ Senate to talk about OER and places that I haven't really been able to get to um, without uh students so that's been that's been beautiful um so yeah i think that's really our update more people are using them um those who are so inclined to tell their liaison librarians they're using them that i, I eventually hear about uh and someday um we'll find a way to uh you know get this ideally on uh promotion and tenure reports so people actually can talk about doing it in a proud way <laughs> and not just hide the information under an assumption that there's no reason to talk about it uh, so yeah that's my update Thanks, Mike. Um, lots going on at UMB, lots of awareness going on. And great to see that you're connecting with the New Brunswick Student Alliance, who is uh, also working in our, uh, we have a task group on awareness and uh, advocacy. So it's great to have that interconnection with those groups. Yeah, they've been great. Um, so just a reminder also uh, that we do have the chat. So if you have any questions, we will have a, a, a Q&A uh, section after everybody has spoken, um, but you can also post in the chat or you can wait to ask your question verbally um, at the end when we speak. So uh, if you have a question now, just post it now and uh, we will gather those up and, and go through them when we get to the Q&A section. Um, so next on our agenda is Megan Landry from St. Francis Xavier University. She is a scholarly communications librarian. Megan. Great. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my update for St. FX will be fairly short, um, but I'm confident we will start to see some more movement and initiatives on our campus in the upcoming months. Uh, so the newest incoming student union vice president academic, Meredith Cudmore Keating, contacted me to see if I would be interested in collaborating with her and another faculty member on a webinar for the St. FX community regarding OERs. Um, she has great interest in champion OERs and open textbooks during her tenure as student union vice president academic and wanted to start a discussion before the fall semester begins. 
Um, last week, I collaborated and presented with Meredith and a faculty member, Erin Maserol, who received a Atlantic OER grant to create an open textbook for her introductory psychology class. Um, the purpose of the webinar was to provide an introduction to OERs, as well as resources on finding existing OER repositories, including obviously Atlantic OER, and information about copyright and open licenses. Uh, Aaron provided uh, an awesome in-depth look at what it's been like to create an open textbook, the process in which she went about adopting and implementing one in her classroom, and she also provided some feedback, both good and bad, that she's received from students, so that was really interesting. Um, the webinar had good attendance, including um, from our interim academic vice president, Tim Hines. He encouraged more discussion on open textbooks and was very open to any ideas we had on possible initiatives for the campus. Um, and in the fall, he said he hopes to hit the ground running with OER, possibly OER pilot projects. One faculty member indicated interest in this and any other future scholarships and, and stated that he fully supports any of these initiatives. And that's everything. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, it sounds like you guys are gaining momentum there at St. of X. It's really great to see that. Um, yeah, just, yeah, we're <laughs> really looking forward to seeing our first books uh, coming from St. of X on the platform. Um, OK, so our uh, next on our agenda is Amy Lorenz, uh, the metadata and copyright librarian from St. Mary's University. Amy. Hi there. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, already feeling a little bit of um, likeness to some of the other presenters, which is really good and affirming because um, I know a lot of this stuff is kind of worked on the sides of our desk um, or a lot of institutions. Um, so this has been a really good year um, for OER awareness. We had a really active students union, uh, SMUSA, which I know uh, Cynthia had worked with. Um, so I too was able to kind of go as a support um, to speak to our Senate um, back in the fall about OERs and support uh, SMUSA's presentation um, on the Atlantic OER project. Um, there is a new executive, brand new slate of uh, students for SMUSA, so I'm hoping to reach out to them to make sure that that continuity and that relationship is kept. Um, I don't want uh, to lose that energy that we had um, uh, with our former uh, VP academic and, and president of SMUSA. Um, we did have one faculty member at SMU um, win one of the grants, um, so really looking forward to some of the work she's been doing. Um, uh, my colleague Patricia, who sits on the OER uh, committee uh, for CAL, and I have really been um, active in the CARL sessions, and as well we've been bringing in our teaching and learning um, uh, center folks as well to those sessions, so we're building a relationship there kind of talk about how we can work, um, reach out to faculty to use OERs. Um, and we found that's a really good um, partnership growing there, um, but also potential competitiveness, which I think we've all kind of encountered. Um, and so that gets me to hoping uh, to develop a more formal group, more formal committee. Um, so we're kind of working on that, um, planting seeds right now at the moment with some with some uh, colleagues now that we're all on campus again. Um, and as in the, the copyright end of things, we're getting a lot more interest of uh, faculty wanting to use open ed stuff or stuff that is a little bit barrier free for the students to access. Um, so we've been uh, helping out a lot of faculty in that regard, which is really good to hear that. Um, and that's about it. Thank you very much, Amy. Sounds like a lot going on there. And uh, I will have a question for you later about the CTL and the engagement there. I'm very interested in that. Um, so next on our agenda is Lindsay McCollum from, uh, she's a scholarly publishing librarian at Mount St. Vincent University. Lindsay. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, the Mount, we have uh, several different projects on the go right now in terms of specifically open textbooks. So we can start off with uh, a project on academic integrity. And as you can imagine, this is quite an expansive topic. And so I'm really pleased that we have quite a collaborative and, and multidisciplinary approach to it. We have folks participating from the library, from the International um, Student Support Office, uh, from the Writing Center, from um, Student Support. There's a lot of different folks who are engaged in this. So, that should be quite an interesting project that uh, is on the go. We also have uh, a public relations textbook. Uh, so if you can think of it, kind of a first year project 
And uh, that is on behalf of the Department of Communication Studies here at the Mount. And again, there's a few folks who are working on that. We also have a really cool project. Um, the Mount recently, we have, I think the first in Canada, a uh, minor in queer studies. And so um, we uh, are adapting a textbook on LGBTQ plus studies. And then we'll be working with some faculty members and some librarians to uh, really beef that up and, and make sure that we have content in there that will support our students. We also interestingly have a project from the Teaching and Learning Center, um, who obviously are an important partner with us in supporting and developing and promoting OER. And they actually are working on an online course development uh, textbook, essentially, or guide. So it's not only for them, but they also recognize the value of sharing this uh, across really anyone working in this field. And of course, the pandemic especially has highlighted the need to share best practices and to determine what works for both faculty, students, and course developers. And then finally, um, I myself am working on, on an open textbook. It's on it's called Choosing and Using Sources, a Guide to Academic Research, First Canadian Edition. I'm taking an American text that I've used in uh, a course that I teach regularly every year and adapting it for Canadian content and also looking to expand on it to incorporate certain perhaps Canadian specific uh, content but also looking to ensure that we have uh, a more nuanced approach to things like traditional knowledge, which I think is quite absent from that text. And I do find that actually working on an open text with myself allows me to better support the faculty and the instructors who are working on these because I can see firsthand where some pain points might be and uh, areas where perhaps I can develop better support mechanisms for our faculty members. I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Lots going on in the Mount as well. I've been, I saw your, well, we brought your two books into, or your three books, actually. Actually, you guys have quite a few books uh, in the Atlantic OER. So I'm glad to see you guys are, are actively adapting and, and getting those ready to go and, and for use in the curriculum. Thanks. Um, next up on our agenda is Anne Matthewman from uh, Dalhousie University. Uh, she is the Associate Dean Learning and Teaching and also the Chief Law Librarian. Anne. Thanks very much, Cynthia. I do have a very short slide presentation that I'm going to bring up here. Hopefully that works, um, mainly to keep myself focused. So I say what uh, I need to say. Um, yeah, so OER at Dalhousie, we've been going for a couple of years now. Um, and it has been a collaboration between um, the Center for Learning and Teaching and Dalhousie Libraries initially. We have a, a co-chair from the Center for Learning and Teaching and a co-chair from the libraries. And we have had some um, participation from the Students' Union as well. We don't have a rep right now because she left, but we're hoping to bring somebody else in. And we've also had a lot of support from um, the provost's office as well, which I think is important. So um, here's a sort of a timeline or a, an order of how things happened at Dalhousie. Uh, we began in 2018 with the group that I talked about. We started educating ourselves as well as trying to educate faculty members and other librarians about OER and um, just had some general discussion about it. And one of the things we wanted to do was find out if there was anything ongoing. And what we found mostly was that there were faculty, a few faculty members who were using and adapting books from um, BC campus and the Ontario platform. Um, but initially there didn't seem to be anybody who was developing their own. We did um, survey of faculty and um, also some focus groups, uh, limited success in terms of the numbers of people who participated, but good information came from those. We had a launch, oh, it's about 18 months ago now, maybe even two years, of a book that um, was developed here at Dalhousie from a textbook, a science textbook. And uh, Jeff Brown, who's in the Dalhousie Libraries, worked with Press Books and with Bill Friedman's wife as he had um, he had died. And we had a launch for that, and that sort of started off the, the interest at Dalhousie, I think, in other faculty members thinking maybe that they would like to develop OERs as well. So 
we have had a grant process and we're focusing the grants on textbooks as opposed to any other open source, open educational resource, because the focus is on students and helping students um, not have to buy <laughs> textbooks if we can produce them as open educational resources. So we've done this for two years and uh, there's a third call out for November. In the first year, the grant, and there was only one, it was funded by the libraries and the Center for Learning and Teaching. And it was uh, awarded to a prof who was doing introduction to psychology and neuroscience. And um, then we had a second call. Money for that came from strategic initiatives funding from the provost's office. So there is the support that I was talking about with the provost. And we did give out five grants in um, in the spring, and those particular uh, textbooks are being worked on as we speak. They have to be finished and the money spent by November, I believe. And then there will be up that number of grants again in November. We are also in the process of preparing an institutional guideline uh, for OER, and in that guideline, um, we're looking at what the purpose is, um, some definitions, why we want faculty members to produce OERs, and what supports are available for them in doing that. And then we were happy to hear the announcement of Atlantic OER, and we're looking forward to that um, being successful as well. Here is a, I've sent my slides to Cynthia, so, um, or, or you can contact me and I'll send them to you directly if you want the links. This is a link to information about the grant process and there's also the application there. So if you're looking to see what a, uh, an application might look for um, or look like rather for um, such a grant, then you can uh, look at that there. But we include, um, you have to um, give a budget, you have to have the support of your teaching unit, uh, it has to be compatible with Creative Creative Commons license, and it has to adhere to the five R's of OER. And then the eligibility is there, and the the uh, the amount can be up to seven thousand dollars. And then here's the purpose of the grants: enhancing the learning experience of students at the university through the adaptation or creation of OER, supporting Dalhousie's teaching and learning strategic priorities and the e-learning strategy, and I've got a link there as well. And as I said earlier, alleviating student financial burden for the cost of textbooks and other educational resources. I've given you a link to some of the successful grant applications. I mentioned the psychology textbook. Uh, one of the librarians here at the law school had got received a grant and she is creating an interactive Canadian legal research skills guide to be used in legal research and writing course and also in the uh, legal materials course at um, across the road at the management school. Uh, there are a couple of different business uh, textbooks as well, but you can see all the descriptions of all those books in this particular link. We've also created a LibGuide. Melissa Rothfuss, I believe, was the person who created this LibGuide, and it, it explains what OER is, how to find them, gives links to a number of sites uh, where there are examples of OERs, shows you um, how to adapt or create OERs, and then talks about the various supports at Dalhousie uh, with copyright, scholarly communications, and digital initiatives. And then this is the infographic that was created in the libraries um, that just has the basics of, of OERs. So that's it uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, lots of exciting things going on at Dell. Glad to see uh, the engagement with the provost. Uh, that seems to be a big uh, in, encouraging factor. Uh, in a, the adoption at institutions these days. Uh, there were some questions that came up in the chat, but we'll save those for after. Um, but I uh, just want to thank you very much. And I will uh, send out the slot and slides. I'll post them to the uh, to the call website with the webinar recording.
Uh, next on our agenda is Jasmine Hoover, the Scholarly Resources Librarian at Cape Breton University, although I think, Jasmine, you might have gotten an, a title change recently, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, otherwise, no. <laughs> that's why I'm going with Scholarly Resources Librarian. Yeah, that's it. Um, and I also just told Jason about this like 10 minutes ago, so Jason's here too. <laughs> so hopefully that's okay. Um, so we have a lot going on at CBU. We have a pretty much formal working group now who works on OER at CBU and it includes um, Jason, who's a geology professor. It includes me, it includes the head of our teaching and learning center, and it also includes the student union. So I think that that is a really good group and we've been kind of working on plans together. Um, so we have two kind of exciting things going on here. The first one is that um, we saw some other schools who were including OER on their course catalog and that's something we weren't sure if we could do. Um, but for the meantime, Student Union went ahead and made a website, which I can probably show actually. Um, and so Jason made a form for professors to fill out and the Student Union took that and put it onto this really nice website that they made um that goes through which courses use open textbooks so students can now go on here and check if their class uses an open textbook and jason tells me that there are about 77 classes on here um so that's something that we were really excited about because it's not coming from us um, or from the learning center or from you know admin it's coming right from the students um and so it's bringing awareness um and we're hoping that professors will see the list and want to be on the list. So that was one really great thing. The second thing is that CVU has given us some funding for a grant program and it is very similar to PEIs. Thank you for your website. We used a lot of your language. Um, it's also very similar to CALS um, grant process and so we're planning on announcing that um, in the next few weeks. We're just working with Marcom because we want to make sure it's kind of an institutional announcement rather than just from us and our little working group. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about is a panel discussion that me and Jason got to do last week with our um, university teaching program. And so hopefully, Jason, if you don't mind talking about the panel and what we talked about a little bit, and then I'll get to our plans for the future after that. You're on mute though. Of course I am. Uh, I just clarify down in the chat, but just uh, just uh, on uh, uh, just to clarify a point as well. The uh, the 77 classes, those are not courses that use open textbooks. They're courses that have no supplementary fees for students. So some of them do use open textbooks. And in fact, as part of the as part of the form uh, that we use to gather the data on classes, we also gather data on attendance, former textbook use and what the materials that are being used now in uh, in exchange uh, for those are. So that data is available if anyone wants it. But that includes people who are using, you know, uh, online resources or nothing at all, who have just gone textbook free. Uh, yeah, so we had uh, last year at the UTP, the University Teaching Program, uh, me and Jasmine did kind of an intro to OER, and we've been doing this a million times, and people are getting sick of hearing it. Uh, so we. We, we modified it this year, so we they gave us a big chunk of time, and so we used that time. We did a panel, uh, uh, two different panels. So the first panel was on um, was uh, from faculty who have made the decision to give up commercial textbooks, and so we had a diverse representation of uh, faculty, uh, everyone from someone who's building a course out right now and made the decision to build it without a textbook, to people who use commercial textbooks in the past, maybe they adopted OER or have uh, or have switched for um, specifically an open textbook or, or switched for something else, you know, some combination of primary readings or whatever. So we had a faculty panel there and then we did our announcement about the 50 grand, the big money. And then after that, we had a second panel that I we can probably make available because they were recorded. But the second panel, we had four of the five uh, call grants recipients to just 
uh, give advice on on how to go about applying for grants in general, how to conceive of a, pro, a project, and an update on where they were, on on you know what they wish they'd done differently, et cetera. And that was a really interesting conversation with a lot of for me, both as a one of the people who judged the uh, the procedure and is thinking about what it'll look like for the call grants next time around. But also for us, as well as someone interested in developing OER, there were some really thoughtful discussions. And out of that actually has come a discussion, a call out to go and do a similar event at MUN. So that's in discussion in the background. So uh, more connections, more spreading the word, et cetera. So that's where we are. OK, and I have a really short list of things we want to work on in the future, because I think this is these are some things that we could all be doing. Um, so some things that came out of our panel as well were that people are interested in workshops on kind of the back end of press books, and I know that's something Carl talked about, so that is something that our faculty are interested in. Um, working on getting upfront costs for materials in the course catalog, I think that's something I would like to see more from like a student perspective of having the right to know upfront costs, um, even if it's not textbooks, you know, sometimes you have to buy extra things for your class and I think that's important for students. Um, a big thing that came out of the panel is working on the culture. So we had a lot of faculty who were interested in using an open textbook, but they were teaching one section and the other faculty didn't want to switch from the current textbook. So how to kind of work within your um, school and your faculty to kind of promote open textbooks um, without getting a lot of pushback or how to handle the pushback. And again, like I think Mike might have said, um, working on kind of tenor promotion and seeing open textbooks as, um, you know, scholarly works. So trying to work on um, increased participation from faculty um, and having it count towards tenure and promotion. And that's it. Thanks a lot, Jasmine. Lots of information, lots going on there. Glad to hear about those grant that grant money that you're getting, even though we'll wait for the official announcement. Uh, but thank you so much. And I'm very interested to hear more about the panel, Jason, because I, I knew you guys had been doing something, but I didn't quite know exactly what. Uh, but that's a panel I think that would be of interest to many uh, others across uh, uh, call as well. Yeah, the uh, Cynthia, one one thing, and, and this is, I was going to expand to what Jasmine said there. One one thing that was quite interesting that came out of it, and this is to everybody, I'd be really interested in discussion, and I think maybe this is, should be a strategic discussion for advocates as well, is that uh, that kind of institutional policy point for, particularly for pp and uh, there was a there was a strong kind of uh, concern both from the audience and panelists about how the culture of you know universities in particular of tenure and promotion haven't caught up yet with uh <laughs> with our push towards oer we had a faculty member who had a contract they were negotiating right now with a commercial publisher and they were thinking about taking that material and making it oer instead but was seriously concerned about how that was going to impact their career and was told that they were advised probably to go with the commercial publisher for tenure considerations uh, two of the panelists brought up the their biggest concern or their biggest surprise was dealing with the you know OER within the culture of their department at their university and getting pushback from other faculty members. So I think there's a lot of discussion that really should take place in terms of uh, pushing for those kind of cultural changes, uh, as well as you know just education and that in the background because I think that's another area of resistance that we maybe haven't touched too much. Thanks so much, Jason. Those are definitely issues we've been hearing about from other other places as well. So it's um, thank you for bringing those up and to the fore in this discussion as well. Um, and we will follow up on those because we definitely want to. Uh, that's that's one of our big foci, I guess, for for Atlantic OER. Um, not to steal your thunder, uh, uh, Daniel. I will not say any too much, uh, but basically uh, that is one of the things we are also focusing on with Atlantic OER and trying to develop across the four provinces in all the institutions. Um, so our last speaker uh, is uh, from Acadia University, Ann Smith, who is the scholarly communications librarian uh, there, and she's going to give us an update on what's happening at Acadia. Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm there right in the middle of it. Well, I, I should say when they return in September. Um, OER are now part of the Acadia University draft academic plan for 2021 to 2025. Um, so the final vote um, 
will take place in Senate in September. So right now it is a draft plan. The way we've been working, and I know some of you have heard this before, the way we were working to get that there is essentially I work with Lydia, who, the, who was at the time the Vice President Academic and External ESU, and we took results of a survey that we ran last year at Acadia and also the good work that we're doing in Atlantic OER. So we took them both to Senate, it went to Provost Council, it went to the Faculty Councils, and we ended on oh, the Board of Governors, and then it's moved into the strate uh, strategic plan, which is great. Part of that work has also involved a cross-campus working group, um, which has, so we have relationships with, we have members from all the faculties, the different disciplines, from the Centre for Teaching and Learning, which isn't officially called that, but it changed its name recently, and I can't quite remember its official title, um, the Acadia Students Union, and so we'll be doing some more work there. Once the strategic plan is passed at that moment, um, things will start rolling again and when it's not the summer, preferably. However, I do want to emphasise that obviously that's not the, you know, by no means the only work that's going into OER on campus. We've got a maths department that have built and used an OER textbook in the past. We've got the chemistry department um, as one department, for example, has been using OER resources for years. And as Mike and I think Jasmine said, um, there are people on campus who are busy doing these things and building these things and using these things. And right now, I probably don't even know about it, which is fine. You know? um, but what I'm saying is there's a lot of good work out there that I'm probably not even referencing here. Um, most recently that I know of, we have had a successful application from people in education to what's called the Research Support Fund at Acadia. Um, 25 55 money and they were successful in receiving that for OERs and open textbooks so there is a funding mechanism um, ideally I'd like you know something that came under the title strategic initiative whoever that was I can't remember but it sounded fantastic or you know as at UPI but there is a path for people to receive money for OERs and they are doing so I'm trying to think if there's anything I've missed quickly. Oh, yes. And one of the last requests we got and somebody mentioned this, maybe Lindsay or maybe Jason. Um, we are now getting interest because of our presentations on Atlantic OER and they do want to know more about, you know, the back end of press books. I'm going to put it the clicks and clunks of it all. We're now at that stage. So we're really looking forward to those kinds of workshops ideally being developed, you know, up through Atlantic OER so that you know, we're not all doing it independently. Not there's anything wrong with that. It's just that this is the moment. This is Atlantic OER's moment. Um, I've got to be honest, I'm on sabbatical. So when everything goes down in September, I may not know. <laughs> OK, thanks. Thanks, Anne. And happy sabbatical. Uh, but I know you're still really involved in OER on your campus, so we're, we're glad to hear that things are really moving forward, especially I was interested to hear that it's been in, being embedded in the strategic plan for the university, which is actually quite exciting um, because that that really does put an official face on OER in an institution uh, and makes it that priority uh, that could organically grow, but now is 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 defined in in the university's strategic vision. Um, so fingers crossed. I'm. I'm <laughs> I know you said it's a draft, but hopefully that will uh, get approval and we'll be moving forward on that. Um, so thank you, everybody who's spoken uh, about what's going on at your institutions. Uh, right now, we're going to just shift it over a bit to Atlantic OER, and Daniel's going to talk about what's going on with Atlantic OER, what's potentially coming up, and then we're going to open up the floor to questions, comments, uh, any anything anybody wishes to share. Uh, so Daniel, please take it away. Sure. It's been great hearing about so many exciting projects that are happening around, and it sounds like there's a lot of interest in Atlantic OER as well, so that's amazing. Um, as Cynthia introduced me before, my name is Daniel Cocroft, and I joined Call in June as a project manager for Atlantic OER. Um, so in the past few months, we've made many changes to the service, and there have been um, lots of plans for many more. We've been very busy. Um, but to keep it brief, I'll just give you an overview of some of the things we've done. Um, we've 
so in, in addition to maintaining our continued support of education educators in the region, we've also um, updated the look and feel of the Atlantic OER website. Um, we've, I think, created a, a much more professional and polished experience. Uh, we've reorganized the content, we've added an FAQ, uh, we've ensured that the entire website is bilingual, and we have made several changes to improve uh, accessibility. Um, we're also proud to say that Atlantic OER has been able to fund projects that have passed over $86,000 in textbook savings for students. So that's a huge milestone. We're very proud to say that. Um, most recently, we've actually been working on our peer review honoraria program. So that will provide a $250 honorarium to subject matter experts who are able to review um, textbooks available on our Pressbooks directory. So this program will probably be launched this week. Um, so keep an eye out for it and um, check it out. Um, so internally, we've been doing a lot of work as well. So um, we've been hard at work developing policies and procedures and best practice manuals. Um, that will sort of provide the structure and, and bones behind everything we do moving forward. And um, many thanks to Cynthia and Jess for helping me uh, in that process. Um, and then finally, another thing we've been working on is the uh, social media presence. Uh, you may have noticed that um, we've really increased our presence on Twitter. Uh, and we're looking to grow our network even farther. So if you want to keep in the loop and see what we're up to at all times, um, make sure to follow the Atlantic OER Twitter page. And I'll just pop that in the chat. Um, and if you have any other questions, uh, let us know. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Daniel has really been doing a lot behind the scenes. Some of the things you don't may not notice, but they're really making a big difference for us in terms of the of the actual uh, provision of the service uh, and making it a little bit easier uh, and, and more streamlined uh, to ensure that we're getting this stuff uh, out and and we're able to better support the educators and anybody else who might be uh, using Atlantic OER or wish to use Atlantic OER. Uh, training sessions, we are actually actively um, Daniel's been investigating the idea of an H5P studio, um, similar to what eCampus Ontario is doing. Uh, we're looking to see how we might actually support that or move that forward because that seems to be one of the biggest um, biggest plugins that our, our educators are using in their creation and adaptation on the platform. It's also the one where we get the most inquiries around. And I saw that Jason had put that into the chat flow as well. Um, so just to give you a heads up, we are investigating H5P and, and the idea of an H5P studio where, where uh, educators can actually create and store their H5P um, pieces. I, I'm, I'm still working on the correct terminology around H5P, uh, but that's something that is on the horizon potentially. Um, so uh, right now we uh, it's 2.43, so I want to make sure we have lots of time for questions. We did have some in the chat. Uh, there were some things that I pulled out of what people had presented on that I I'm, will see whether they come up, and if not, I'll bring them forward. But otherwise, I want to start with uh, Jasmine had a question for Dal and UPEI about promoting their grants. How are you guys promoting your grants? So um, at Dalhousie, most of it was looked after by the our communications person within the libraries. It was on the library's website. It was on the CLT, the Center for Learning and Teaching website, posted anywhere where um, grant and award applications were are posted throughout the university. And then I think it was um, a lot of Twitter posting and uh, word of mouth as well. Uh, at PEI, um, I made sure to go out through all the campus communication channels. So we have a daily uh, kind of like newsletter that goes out called Campus Notices. And so I made sure to submit to uh, that publication. Um, I also sent it out on a faculty listserv and 
Um, I also contacted people directly that I knew were interested in creating OERs just to like give them a heads up to say, hey, this is an opportunity in case you wanted to hire some student assistance or something. Um, I also scheduled um, information sessions across campus at, at different times of the day. So I wanted them to be drop in information sessions. So if they had questions about what is an OER or what would this project qualify as an OER, um, what kind of things can I do with this? So I made sure to do it. I made sure to have like, I think it was like four or five sessions over a couple of weeks and I made sure for they were all at different times. So one in the morning, one at lunchtime, one in the evening, one after classes or like, you know, in the late afternoon, um, I scheduled them all at different times and they were all across campus as well. So tried to hit different buildings each time. Um, and yeah, I think I hope there was some word of mouth too, um, but those were just a few of the um, the drop in sessions. So I think were really um, helpful. I only just had a few people, but I, I think that um, I'm glad that I got those few people because they did end up applying. So. Thank you, Kim and Anne. Um, I see uh, Jason, you have your hand up. Yeah, just sort of a follow up on that, and it can go to either one of the uh, respondents, but it can also go more broadly. Um, so in addition to what strategies seemed to work for you, did you get any feedback and it could be just, you know, it could be anecdotal feedback, just quiet conversations or whatever of reasons why faculty weren't applying, like they thought about it, but what, what some of the barriers to uptake of people who are aware of it, but then didn't follow through? I can say that one of the things we heard was that faculty members thought it would be too much work to start from scratch to create something when they were teaching and marking and trying to get their courses in order that this would just be something uh, that was too much. Um, also, I think that um, there was some trepidation as how it might affect tenure and things like tenure and promotion committees and things like that because um, it wasn't a published book. Now I don't know if those are still concerns, but they were concerns earlier on. Yeah, I would just echo uh, the time and um, workload issues as Lindsay has uh, said here in the, the chat, but I think the time that they think about um, dedicating to writing a whole book. So one of the things that I remember from an information session drop in was that I encouraged people to think about this in a non-traditional way. So maybe they could split the book up into a volume one, a volume two, part one, part two, and um, you know they could approach it that way. Or maybe it's a lab manual, or maybe it's a workbook or a guidebook. Um, so I tried to think of suggestions on how that they could break it down into smaller um, approachable goals and then also partnering. Um, I did suggest to people to partner with other people uh, at the on campus or at other institutions. So maybe if you could get um, five people and everybody could commit to one chapter, then it might be more approachable. Um, those are the kind of things that I tried to offer, uh, as well as maybe finding some books that they could just adapt instead of writing from scratch, right? Um, that was definitely something I talked about um, being available to help them search and find things that they could just adapt. And just to, to follow up on what Kim said, uh, sort of tangentially, unfortunately, Lynn McGregor from NSCC, the Nova Scotia Community College, wasn't able to make it today to present, although we will be getting an update from her uh, so that we can post that with the uh, the, the recording. Uh, but one of the things that they're doing is uh, they have a service in the library where they will actually uh, if a faculty member comes to them and says, I, we want to do, I want to do this book on whatever, um, they will actually go out and actively search for books. Um, so to find a collection or potential op options for books that already exist that that faculty member could potentially adapt and provide that list to the faculty member. So they're sort of making it a little bit easier instead of the faculty member have to potentially do all the, the legwork uh, to give them a little bit of a a leg up to, in starting that process. So it's related to the adapting versus creating from scratch to save time, but also um, the library is actually helping them find what potential open textbooks out there that might they might use. Anne. I just remembered another thing that I heard um, anecdotally 
was if I create an OER, what if somebody comes along and adapts it and changes it and it's a very different from my original purpose in um, creating it? Again, it might not have been a genuine concern, but it was one that that we heard. That's a very interesting one because they, they as the whole philosophy behind open ed, uh, OER is that it is shareable and and, and changeable. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, potentially there might also be the uh, some question about uh, the idea of licenses and and the Creative Commons licenses and what those could or could not convey. Um, if there are concerns in that area, I mean, we're all striving for as open as possible, but um, if it comes to down to having something there to use versus um, making sure that that person makes it as open as possible, we might even just want to accept that at least it's there for the students to use in that particular course or that particular institution. So, yeah, um, so yeah it might come down to that whole education around licensing. Exactly. Uh, you can just read that later, Cynthia. It's not relevant right now. It, it, it's just, it's just a comment. Cynthia, you're muted. Oh, there we are. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to read it. Also, I was just flagging in case uh, while I was trying to read it, in case you wanted to say it out loud. Um, one thing that uh, Daniel is actually trying to do, and I heard Lindsay uh, was uh, had talked about, is the whole idea of accessibility and building those accessibility accessibility standards into textbooks. So I'm actually curious to hear about those who actually have repositories going or are using it um, about accessibility standards or how you're building that into your process or conveying that to uh, educators who are creating or adapting um, because. I know Daniel is actually working on um, standards for the call and procedures for the Atlantic OER resources. So I'm curious to what's happening, let's say at EPEI around accessibility or anybody else. Lindsay. <laughs> um, thanks. I can talk about uh, work that I've been doing. So. I've taken a lot of it from the BC Campus Guide on Accessibility. I, I have found that very useful. And so to kind of model that approach, I've been really focusing in particular on things like alt text. That's been alt text not just for um, images, but also for links as well. And so uh, testing it out on my own textbook has made me realize how much work it is. And also that writing alt text is a lot more, there's a lot more work to writing alt text than it seems. Like it's not enough just to scribble down what you think you see. To actually make it a good piece of alt text, there is some thought and careful process that has to go into it. So I'm um, currently working on kind of my own internal processes around that. and. Um, something that I think is really valuable, especially for that kind of work, is looking at grants to get students involved. Um, you know, many institutions, they have grants for student works or um, maybe Young Canada works in the summer, for, for instance. Um, but ensuring that you have students working on that kind of work not only allows the project to go much more quickly, but of course it also ensures that the content is accessible and the student is learning some really interesting and valid skills when it comes to making accessible content. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Kim? I would echo what Lindsay was saying about um, that's what our OER associate has been doing um, for a couple of our books that uh, faculty had already published. She went and did an accessibility audit based on the checklist that is in the um, the the book that Lindsay mentioned, and she went back and was adding um, descriptive links uh, descriptive text to the links and as well as she's also um, done some transcripts for the geospatial humanities book that um, is going to be coming hopefully in the fall. She did some transcripting of some multimedia uh, for that project and um, one of the things that I believe maybe it was someone here that shared or when we were at um, the, OE, uh, the OER leadership essentials um, session that they mentioned that onboarding the faculty whenever you give them grants that they had wished they had spent more time uh, like getting the faculty 
um, on board and letting them know what their requirements were. And so I created like a, a welcome packet for the faculty, which is just a digital version of it. And I included a link to that accessibility toolkit to let them know this is something that they need to consider up front. So hopefully it caught them before they were too deep into their book and they knew about these things. But this is definitely something, you know, if you are able to give grants, this is something they could potentially help out with. Are you open to sharing that welcome kit? You know, I'll have to look back at it and see if, uh, yes, I will share it, but uh, <laughs> it was my first round, so everybody be gentle. <laughs> it's better that we have nothing at the moment, and that's one of the things we're really trying to develop is the, beyond just the procedures, is also the, not just the back end procedures, but the front end for, um, for educators, especially those that get grants and want to create, so that's fantastic. I like the idea of calling it a welcome kit, too. It, does sound welcoming <laughs> and, and not proscriptive, I guess is the way to say it. Uh, let's see. So that was uh, accessibility. Does anybody else have anything they wanted to uh, put in? It would be really nice if Pressbook had sort of an accessibility checker, sort of like Word does or Excel does, where it, you could do that without having to do it manually. Um, that is something I, I've been thinking about, but that's for another day. Uh, okay, uh, the other thing I had that came up was uh, several folks are engaging with their centers for teaching and learning, learning and teaching or whatever it's called. Uh, do you have any guidance or suggestions or things about how to best do that, uh, that engagement with those groups or uh, some of the things you learned that potentially not to do that you might want to share? Oh, Lindsay has her hand up. I'm sorry. I just saw that. Lindsay, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I've been working for quite a while now trying to form a closer relationship with the Center for Teaching and Learning. And um, it, the pandemic, despite being awful, in some ways actually helped because it meant a lot more individuals were hired in the Center of Teaching and Learning and because of the demand. And so now we actually have um, individuals who, similar to the way that liaison models work for librarians, you know, in the humanities and the sciences and professional studies, they have a similar, they've adopted a similar approach with um, their, their um, course developers as well. So that means that it makes it easy for me when I talk to individuals, I know I'm focused in a particular area. And one approach I've taken is that I've contacted each of the individuals who are responsible for their area and ask them about um, the new contracts that they've signed or the upcoming projects that they know are coming down the pipeline. And someone, you know, for example, um, one person was working on history, like history and women and feminism. So automatically I go and find what content already exists. And sometimes it's open textbooks, but I also look for additional content as well. And I send it and say, here's what currently exists that are open, that the individual, and this is before they've ever started looking themselves, the individual could potentially want to incorporate as they develop the course. And so I'm hoping that this, you know, little infiltration um, allows the, the individual who's developing the course to automatically be thinking about OER from the very beginning, rather than, you know, later on down the process, I suddenly realize this is happening, share something, but they've already decided on a textbook and started creating content around it, for instance. So I'm trying to intersect much earlier in the process to ensure that at least they know from the very beginning that this is an option. And thus far, it seems promising. Uh, again, uh, there's always the issue of, I don't know how much time I have, et cetera, et cetera, but um, I'm feeling fairly optimistic with this approach thus far. Thanks, Lindsay. That's excellent news. Um, and thanks for sharing those. Uh, what you, I really like the idea of proactively asking CTL about the projects that they know about. Um, that isn't an avenue I had thought about. So thank you very much for sharing that. Anybody else had an answer uh, or a response to that particular question? Um, one of the things I wanted to note, uh, I forget who had said it, uh, but just the idea that um, there is a national discussion going on around OER. Uh, Carl is sort of shepherding that, but there are a lot of voices at the table discussing the idea of a national strategy around OER and how that potentially might look or occur or what that might involve. Um, so we will continue to share information about those sessions as they come up. Uh, but 
uh, there will be some presentations, uh, actually a couple from Canada, uh, a group across Canada at the Open Ed Conference coming up uh, this fall. So just keep your eye out for that as well. Um, there was something else that I wanted to mention. Um, oh yeah, the ZTC, I, we saw that on uh, the CBU Student Union, uh, but that seems to be uh, the new buzzword around the whole zero credit. It's zero textbook credit uh, or is it zero textbook credit, I think is what it says, or zero, no, sorry, zero textbook costs. So it's, uh, there was some concern around the whole idea of ZCred uh, as a term uh, in terms of what it meant and what the uh, a common understanding. So zero textbook costs or ZTC seems to be the newest buzzword around that, um, that seems to better convey what is meant by that uh, acronym or those, those terms. So. Just to give folks a heads up on terminology, I see that we're at uh, we're a little past three, so I am going to sign off here for the the or uh, for this session. But thank you so much to all of our speakers and everybody who was so open and sharing. Um, this is great. We want to have more of these discussions uh, because I think there's a lot that we can share with each other that we just don't know is happening at our various uh, institutions, um, and so facilitating discussion is something we really want to have a focus on for the coming year is that idea of you know we need to talk more with each other and learn from each other and share and and potentially um, help each other um, so we will be uh, having more of these types of sessions over the coming year so just to give you a heads up on that i will post the uh, the recording and uh, slide deck and also i'm going to be posting um, lynn's update and, and also a little bit of a summary, a, a written summary of some of the key points that came out of here that folks thought were really great ideas. Uh, so thank you all very much. And uh, oh, wait a second, Jason has his hand up. Jason. Um, I just had an epiphany just really quickly. I just wanted to <laughs> just share to people. So uh, in terms of places to promote, I hadn't thought of this before, but I think most people should now be coming into the uh, the often mandatory uh, TA professional development day or a few days. And given that all of those guys are going to be potential or a lot of them are potential professors, as well as often sessionals and adjuncts uh, coming up soon, it might be a way, a place to sneak in to promote uh, OER uh, student supports and OER lab things. So for example, I use a Pressbooks hosted um, interactive laboratory practice sheet um, for some of my classes. But that might be a way of not only supporting non-traditional kind of OER, not just the textbooks, but also a way of hitting a market that's going to come online for us in a couple of years, you know, planting the seed early. Anyways, just thought of that. Thanks, Jason. Epiphanies are always welcome. <laughs> that's the nice thing about these discussions. They generate those, those thoughts that you might not have uh, considered before. So uh, thank you very much for sharing. And uh, if any, any other questions anybody had uh, or questions, things to share. If not, uh, I would like to thank you all and wish you all a great rest of your day. I'm hoping the weather's cleared up, but I can't quite tell from here. Um, thank you thank all. You. Thank you.